IBM's build a new computer chip for artificial intelligence. It is 15 times more powerful than previous similar designs, and it's an analog computer. For a long time, the most powerful computers were analog. Until in 1947, when the first transistor was developed at Bell Labs, this invention had a profound effect on the whole world. And starting from there, digital computers have grown exponentially. And nowadays, all the computer chips we use are digital. However, there is an issue with the conventional computer architecture. Usually, there are two main blocks, memory and a CPU, which are connected by a data bus. And this data movement between the memory and the CPU is the bottleneck, which dominates the runtime as well as energy consumption. A simple example, if we want to add two 32-bit numbers together, this whole add operation will take us one picojoule. But before we can perform this operation, we need to fetch the data from the memory. And this fetching of the data takes us two to three nanojoules. So the actual moving the data from the memory takes orders of magnitude more power, up to 10,000 times more power than the actual computation. In the past, it was not so bad. A couple of decades ago, CPUs were much slower at computing, so this ratio was much more balanced. But today, with CPUs being so much faster, with new technology nodes, this ratio has gotten so much out of balance that we have to do something about it. Moreover, it's getting even more critical for applications like deep learning, because they are very data intensive. All of these aspects are contributing to the great comeback of analog computers. Now, IBM is addressing exactly this bottleneck with their new Hermes analog chip. Yeah, so it's a multi-core analog in-memory computing chip. So it has 64 cores that can be used to do matrix multiplications in the analog domain. So using the circuit laws basically to, to compute the, the dot products. The nice thing about it is that we completely eliminate the separation between memory and processing. So we do really processing in the memory. So that is the main thing that this analog approach can allow. The idea is that instead of spending all this precious energy to moving the data back and forth, we will just move the compute engine to the memory. It's similar how we humans do the mental calculations. In our head, the computing is happening in the network of interconnected neurons. And this mental arithmetic is a complex interplay of cognitive processes memory retrieval, and logical reasoning, all orchestrated by the activity of neurons. The new IBM chip is designed to function in the same way, so the calculations are performed on the data which resides in memory. I've already made a video about one commercial analog chip by Mythic, but this one is based on a relatively old flash technology. But this work from IBM is the cutting edge research. And here they are using so-called phase change memory technology, which IBM is also fabricating by itself. Phase change memory, what it's good at is multi-level storage. So it can store more than one bit. It's very easy to store more than one bit in phase change memory because how it works is you basically uh, change the volume of this amorphous phase inside a phase change material. And that is uh, much more controllable than, for example, in RERAM, where you try to change the volume of a metal filament inside that device. So that is a very stochastic process, very difficult to control, you know, how big is this filament with uh, electrical pulses, right? But with phase change memory, it's rather easy. Basically, we take the weights from the neural network and store it in the conductance values of the phase change memory. This means in such a memory, instead of storing typical zeros and ones, we can store any analog value in between, let's say 0 0.354. So we can store multiple bits, or let's say equivalent of multiple bits, in a single memory cell. 
At the moment, IBM managed to store up to the four equivalent bits in one memory cell. Basically, how it works is that we heat up the memory to uh, make it amorphous, and then uh, we heat it up to the crystallization temperature to make it crystalline. So we basically melt it to make it amorphous, and then we crystallize it to make it crystalline. So that is how we can switch between two states, and then how we can store more than one bit it's by modulating the size of that amorphous region inside the phase change memory device. Now, how do we map it to the real neural networks? First, we program our memory cells with weights. And we encode the input X of the neural network into the input voltage. On the analog mesh, each X will be multiplied by weights and we sum up the currents at the output. And this is the output from the neural network. And I find it brilliant because it is so simple yet elegant at the same time. And then the main thing is what we did is we kind of interface those analog cores with digital cores. Because when we run neural networks, usually we have some activation functions like ReLU, Sigmoid, etc. There's also a bunch of other operations, scaling operations that need to be done as well. So it's basically a chip that can execute all the operations that are involved in the convolutional layers and the LSTM layers on the chip. This new IBM chip was fabricated in Albany, in upstate New York. They have R&D there and also fab with clean rooms. If you remember IBM's 2 nanometer transistors, these were also developed there at the Albany Nanotech fab. Uh, was essentially done in Zurich. Uh, it's a, I mean, it's a global collaboration within IBM. So we are, are collaborate with also some of the units in the U.S. But this particular chip was essentially designed uh, in Zurich. Yes. So the fabrication, the PCM is done in Albany, uh, in New York. Uh, so and the CMOS is done by an external foundries. Right now, the chip can implement more than four million parameters. But of course, the plan is to scale it further up, to be able to handle billions of parameters on a single analog chip. This kind of technology will be beneficial uh, as soon as we can start to integrate like uh, something like billions of weight on a single chip, right? I mean, that's where we can really be competitive against the digital chips. The limiting factor is not really the size of the phase change memory devices because they are rather small. It's about 100 by 100 nanometer. Uh, uh, 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer or so, roughly. Uh, so, so these devices are rather small. What is more difficult is to integrate them in a crossbar at, at, at very high density. Uh, so there are a number of factors that limit this. Uh, one of them is uh, how low we can go in, in terms of the metal layer in the backend integrations. I mean, not only we need to uh, integrate the devices at a, at a higher density, but we need also to make the periphery smaller or reduce the amount of ADCs, whatever, but just to basically be able to make a, a small crossbar. You see, one of the biggest challenges of this technology is actually the readout electronics. Because if we talk of conventional memory, we use very basic uh, electronic circuits, like just latches for the readout. But in case of phase change memory technology, we use analog to digital converters, so-called ADCs, to convert the analog signal back to the digital. And these circuits are pretty massive. And in order to be able to scale this technology further, we have to find a way to scale this without electronics drastically. And this is one of the biggest challenges. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. What was so particularly interesting for me in this work. As you know, I am a chip designer, so electrical engineer, but I do have software background. So what was so interesting for me, how does I manage the software stack in case of analog chips? Let's say your analog chip is finally working, this beautiful masterpiece of engineering. Now you would need a compiler, right? So you can take your PyTorch code and run it on the analog chip what what will happen is something like like the following so uh we had we first you know get a, a network as you said in pytorch uh first thing we would need to do is basically to retrain this network 
using this uh, hardware-aware training. So that's something we did in the paper also. And that is essentially to uh, kind of make the network more robust to this analog noise and, uh, you know, whatever happens in the, in the chip. Uh, so we basically train by ejecting noise on the synaptic ways to make the network stronger or more resilient to, you know, the non AITs of the analog hardware. So when we map the network on the hardware, it will not have a significant accuracy drop. Uh, so we have this open source toolkit that does this, which was also used in the in the paper. So we just call this IBM uh, AR Direct Kit. Now, after that, it would need to go to some kind of compiler, right? So which would essentially, you know, list all the jobs that have to be done and also map the network on the different arrays and, and so on. And then after that, you know, uh, the chip would be programmed. Uh, it's very similar, I think, to any of the other software stack that you might see from the different startups. I mean, there's not like so many ways to do it. So, but we are really working on trying to make the training as agnostic as possible to the hardware, because otherwise, I mean, what would happen is that you kind of need to train the network for every chip. This is not possible. I mean, that would make the deployment like a big nightmare, right? One of the main drawbacks of using analog computers is the accuracy. And there are many aspects to this. First of all, how precise we can program all the memory cells. Then, how accurate can we compute and read out the result. And eventually, how well the memory cell can retain the accurate value over a long time. And yes, I would say Artificial intelligence compute does not need this high precision of digital. But if you think about this, if we do 20, 30, 50 operations, uh, multiply accumulate operations in a row, and we do it in analog way, it can be that the, the output, the result is completely distorted. In this work, IBM team has implemented several techniques to improve the accuracy. First of all, after they program a memory cell with a weight value, they will measure it once again. And if it doesn't match the target value, then they will adjust the programming pulse until they get the right value stored in the cell. So the, the only thing that, uh, so yeah, we, we have to worry about is how much noise is, uh, is resulting from after you, you've programmed, so how much you know, how, how much noise do we get when we do the matrix multiplications and also how stable are these conductance states? Because mm -hmm. in phase change memory, for example, uh, the resistance or the conductance states are not stable in time, so they drift, right? So the conductance is basically going down over time. So there's a figure in the paper that shows this. Uh, so and how we mitigate it is by digital scaling of the output. And uh, we have two 56 ADCs at the output that read all the, that, you know, we'll convert the analog values that we get at the output to digital values. And then these digital values are uh, scaled and offset per column using the digital processing unit. Mm -hmm. And so this way we can compensate for column to column variations, for example, in the ADC gains and things like that. But we can also compensate for this conductance drift in this way. Eventually, they achieved 92.8% accuracy on a classical image classification task. And they mentioned in the paper that this is the highest accuracy achieved to date using analog chips using similar technology. Talking of computing efficiency, in this work, IBM team measured throughput per area. This chip is capable of 400 giga operations per second per area. It is 15 times more powerful than previous similar designs, which means this chip is a big step forward towards building more efficient analog chips for AI. Right now, there is a lot of exciting research ongoing in this direction. And pretty much every company in Silicon Valley has a research project working on analog chips because there is a lot of potential. But at the moment, it's still not clear if the wide adoption of uh, analog chips will happen or not. For me, the wide adoption of multi-bit memory will be the indicator. And then I can tell you, yes, analog chips will happen. And even then, analog chips will be used for inference application. 
and still not for the training. Because to implement the training of neural network models on an analog chip, we need to build in many different functions in the hardware to allow flexibility for training. And that's very challenging to implement on an analog chip. Uh, so we have done quite some work on training also, right? But it's more like research, let's say, than, uh, you know, we have not designed yet a training chip uh, because it's a lot more complicated. So training is, a, so it's not only matrix multiplications in that case, there's a lot of different other operations that have to be supported. So, I mean, my thinking about the training is, it's not it's not very clear yet how the analog architectures can benefit um, can be beneficial for training in the sense that, that training is something that is that you want to customize so much I and mean, so you you really want to do the training uh, with your own parameters and your own optimization algorithm and so on that you can choose so it's kind of very hard to go away from a digital you know general purpose processor because that that can support all this but if you have a dedicated architecture for training, it's a lot more difficult. And another thing that limits, you know, how much you can do in terms of training with these devices is that, for inference, the weights are stationary, right? So they're programmed only once and then you use them a bunch of times. So, uh, but during training, you will have to reprogram the weights during the training, right, to update them. Uh, and that also leads to other uh, challenges in terms of the endurance of these PCM devices or RERAM devices, which is not infinite. So uh, DRAM has nearly infinite endurance, so you can program it like maybe 10 to the 15 times and it won't die. But PCM, no, so, and RERAM uh, neither. So uh, endurance typically can be between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 9 pulses. After that, the device is dead. So that is... That means you cannot do so many weight updates on a single. Mm -hmm. I mean, otherwise, you know, it will die at some point. So, so that is some. All of these things need to be mitigated somehow. So, at the moment, for deep neural network training, digital chips like dedicated AI accelerators like Cerebras or Dojo from Tesla or even GPUs, digital chips seem to be better fit for training at least for now. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Now check out another video on my channel where I explain the recent advances in the CPU technology. Many people have found it very interesting. I will link it below. And if you want to support this channel, consider becoming a Patreon. The link is also in the description. Thank you and see you in the next video. Ciao.